Fill her up. You're listening to the Gas Digital Network. Michael Malice here. Let that be your welcome for the next hour. We have with us a returning guest, Matt Taylor, who's actually going to talk this time. Uh, your new documentary, Marcel Duchamp, The Art of the Possible, drops today. It does. Uh, you were here previously with Dr. Robert Epstein. About talking about the creepy line, yep. which we're going to talk about a little bit later as well. Uh, Marcel Duchamp is uh, not a household name. But no. in the art world, he most certainly is. He's an extremely influential artist. No. Uh, you've been working on this documentary forever. Yeah, it was a it was a five year production horizon, and then and then once you're done with a film, it takes another year for it to get out. But the story really starts in the late '90s. Is when I kind of started getting the idea to actually do a project like this. It just took a long time to get there. Yeah, like what's the? I mean. What's the process of putting together a film about one of the iconic uh, modern artists? Well, you know, it's complicated because I actually argue you can't make a movie about Marcel Duchamp because, like, the guy, like, purposely went out of his way to obfuscate history being able to tell a story about Marcel Duchamp. He, he had pranks. He fiddled with the mediums of the day. So... To, to do it, you have to kind of either pick like the history narrative or you have to pick the idea narrative. And so I thought the idea narrative was more interesting. I, I, I think that he's an artist for the 21st century. And we set out, set out to recontextualize him for now. But it is a very complicated thing because, again, he overlaps with so many other artists. Um, and he's just all over the place. So for people who haven't heard of him, who don't know them. And we're going to talk about the... I, I, one of the things that drives me crazy is how so many... I'm going to use the word Philistines, only half ironically, <laughs> think all of uh, contemporary art, which they think is synonymous with modern art, is basically a Jackson Pollock painting, which it is not. And they'll and I, there's many people who I know mm -hmm. who have this perspective, yeah. uh, and I'll take them to MoMA or the Brooklyn Museum, mm -hmm. and I'll be like, look, I get how you're saying half of this is crap. You can't tell me that all of it's crap or that all of it's the same crap yeah. in the same way. So who is Marcel Duchamp? So to give the basic understanding, Duchamp was a, he was basically kind of a French dandy. He came out of this French household. He was born in the late 1800s. Um, his older brothers were artists. Uh, he was kind of 10 years behind them. So they went to Paris because everybody goes to Paris. Um, he goes to Paris eventually, but he's kind of enamored with technology. He's essentially like a like a technologist, right? Because at the time you have like wireless telegraphy, you have you have things coming out of Madame Curie's lab, and really a big thing is you have the the invention of cinema and these other kinds of of technologies that are basically changing the context of like how you think. So like they they had the X ray, so you could see through things. So everyone's paradigm of the world is shifting, and this is right before World War One. So Marcel Duchamp's this young guy. And he is just absolutely blown away by tech. It'd be like right now, and you got an iPhone in 2007 or something like that. He is all in. And some of the ideas that kind of break his brain are, again, the, the cinema, um, the idea of non-Euclidean geometry, the idea of undoing mathematics, the fourth dimension. I mean, these are like crazy ideas. And while other artists like the uh, Cubists are also based on things like the fourth dimension and non-Euclidean geometry. Duchamp's the one who actually gets the fact of how it shifts paradigms, right? The other guys thought, oh, it's kind of interesting. We'll do some paintings. He was actually starting to question everything because of these breakdowns. So what happens is he basically explores all these different styles and he comes to cubism that's like oh this is this is the most interesting the most modern if four years earlier like brock and picasso were doing their thing uh and he paints this painting called the new descending the staircase and it's kind of a yeah, we're getting ahead of ourselves yeah yeah okay. well, yeah yeah, yeah. So, so, so that, that, that is the, the beginning of his journey so my favorite art movement 
I was going to say by far, but Warhol's probably second, and both of these overlap heavily with Duchamp, yeah. is the Italian Futurists, right? Oh, yeah. So they were around Absolutely. in the early 1910s. Yep. Uh, Marinetti was a kind of their philosopher king. I have a yep. book signed by him. And th- this is something that seems almost incomprehensible, even in 2020, mm-hmm. where you had a group of artists who were not only hardcore righties, right-wingers, yeah. <laughs> but they were also in love with machinery. Yeah. They were in love with technology, their name Futurism. Yep. So they were talking about things like, let's burn down museums, uh, let's yep. destroy all the past. Destroy libraries. You destroy libraries. Glorify war. Yeah, and have a <laughs> world of art dedicated yeah. to speed and strength yes. and the future. And if you look at their paintings from 1912, mm-hmm. they still have, they're trying to capture energy and motion in yeah. two dimensions, which is very hard to do. And you look at it now, it still is like very moving. I love uh, it. Yeah. It's, Futures it, is one of my favorite. The, the manifestos killer they're and they're, they're still crazy <laughs> they're still crazy like a hundred years ago yeah. you read it and yeah. it, the kind of the energy and the emotion behind it is so like you know f you and and there's a, yeah. there's a very pre-punk aspect to it yeah so the, what people don't get is when you're looking at a uh, modern art mm-hmm. right it is a conversation with the viewer so yes. that's why when you look at it, you're like what the hell am i looking at they are saying a response so before modern art you had yeah realistic art yeah but then once you invented the camera yeah. and you invented movies it's like what the f is the good of yeah. being able to point re- paint realistically if we have cameras so they're like yeah. okay what's what is the point of painting at all and this was a big kind of challenge for mm-hmm. painters at that time and that's what picasso and duchamp kind of uh, uh rose to that challenge yeah i mean look it, it's interesting because i think that you know Art history has art becomes art history after twenty years, right? Sure. The context is gone. It's all about context, right? This is another material Duchamp plays with, and I think a big misunderstanding of these artists of that period, especially like futurist, right? Because futurism clearly gets gets shoved aside for surrealism, right? Because they they butt up against each other, sure. And some of them even convert to surrealism, the age of isms. But I think people forget that these guys. Whether it's futurist, whether it's Dadist, whether it's the Favist, any of these guys, we're dealing with these massive paradigm shifts of their day, right? It's different than now, where you have kind of like the dealers, like, hey, man, I need 20 paintings from you to sell to some guys. These guys were actually grappling with what would eventually become a world war, two of them, you know, and wipe out their homes and kill their families. So they were really trying to understand the context of a shifting world moving, you know, you have the new world across the Atlantic, all these heathens over there, yeah. and you have Europe changing and the monarchies falling. So yeah, you, you get this interesting period where like, they're not painting because, oh, I just like to paint. They're just really trying to figure out like, where in the hell are we all heading? Right. You know, there's a machine that just put all my farmer friends out of work, or they're they're saying we could see through walls. You know, what does it mean? And then clearly it, you know, because the irony of the of the futurists is, you know, they're practically like a bunch of them are killed in World War One. Like they they achieve what they wanted. Yes. They got it. Yeah. They got it. And it was just this horrific thing, you know. Um, and they follow through. They fall through. Yeah, the quote was, war is the world's only moral hygiene. And yeah. they're like, they all signed up, and they, and it were worked. All, they all are killed. All <laughs> it these young, all young artists, yeah. But but it also, it's interesting because it causes the shift of pushing other artists to the new world, which is, I think, you know, the irony is the futurists, you know, we're calling on this thing, and it shifts them over here. Um, and, of course, World War II does the same, where it finally completely eliminates Europe from the from the artistic, you know, conversation. But these things that they're pushing for, some people are trying to hold back. I mean, for a lot of ways, the Cubists, while they thought futuristically, they were still very doctrinaire, um, you know. And that was actually a thing. If you think about it, like, a lot of the movements at the time, you know, they had manifestos, yeah. right? These are the rules. And that's kind of the irony of modernism, rules for modernism right. like what does that mean you know and again this would be a thing that duchamp directly challenges with the new descending staircase and the other thing is again 1917 you have the russian revolution yeah you can argue with which no one had ever seen anything like it before never uh, in a sense and you could argue with a straight face like everything's different now so yeah. what does that mean for art what is art where everything is different now mean yeah so let's talk about this new descending a staircase because what i learned from the documentary which was fascinating Let's throw it up on the screen. So you look at it, 
there's nothing recognizably nude about it. There's nothing really. Mm-hmm. There's a staircase you can recognize. Yeah. Um, it's certainly not uh, obscene. Wait, do we have the picture? No. Okay. You didn't get my email. Okay. <laughs> um, let's get this. There. Can we pull? There's a picture called um, "Nude Descending a Staircase." If we could just flash it on the whole screen. This painting. Again, which is you hear nude, you think yeah. erotic, you think obviously nudity. There's the human form is not really recognizable with it, but mm-hmm. it causes a huge, huge backlash. So it tell does. me about that story. So, par- and what year was this? This would be 1912. Okay, and of course the nude descending staircase saga happens over five years, but the initial kind of implosion happens where Duke Shop, he's like you know he's 25, he paints this painting, and and again. You know, he paints a painting because remember, it's all about rules. Cubism is about multiple dimensions simultaneously. Futurism, as you brought up, is about motion. Yes. Well, he paints a painting where it's kind of a combination of both. And of course, the futurists had their show earlier, a little bit earlier. And, you know, these these cubists were going to have this showing because essentially what happens is Picasso and Brock have this art dealer and he's like, you guys are like superstars so you don't need to like be part of these shows and all these things but these smaller cubists kind of banded together and what they wanted to do was they wanted to essentially have like a unified showing an art movement as they say and so duchamp's kind of on the younger end and he brings in the new descending staircase and he hangs it up and the first thing is that um the, the cubists are essentially like uh that kind of breaks the rules. That kind of doesn't follow. And and the big issue was actually I don't the, see it. The, the, there it no, is. There okay. she is. So yeah. So the big issue is that is the title, right? The title but that, is but a that's problem. That's just amazing. Looking at this, <laughs> right? It, yeah. It's it's kind of garbled in a sense. Like you can, if someone tells you new descending a staircase, okay, you can make out definitely there's an angle in the yeah. middle of the painting, but. So they're having an issue. What I love about this is they have a problem with the title, right? Yeah, new descending a staircase. Title. Duchamp being a troll in his own way. Yeah. He literally writes the title on the painting. Yeah. So they can't even say, well, change the title, be fine. It's like, no, 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 it's on the painting. It's part of the piece. Yes. Well, this is the thing, because these are, this is the beginning of some of what he starts fiddling with, this idea of like, what's the point of language? Like, these are the early kernels of him saying, well, what if I try this? What if I try that? Because again, he's looking at the, remember, there's all of these, there's all of these uh, uh, new imaging technologies where you can watch a horse gallop and they they discovered that there's a moment where the horse's feet are off the ground because they could, with a camera. The, the, and, to break it down for people, this was a big argument historically, right? Yes. When a horse runs, is there any point where it's basically flying? Exactly. Right? And they had the, the camera work yeah. at that point, finally, technology yeah. is so good that they could do it frame by frame and they could see, look, there yep. actually is a point where the horse is off the ground. Yes. And so it's almost like he's taking all of those images and putting them on top of each other and showing movement, right? I mean, if you, it, it's a, it's it's like the night watch of, you know, of Rembrandt. Like, this is the first painting that shows people in motion. Like, he is taking that to another level. He's combining these styles. So clearly the Cubists, the first thing that they're irritated with is the fact that it's called a nude descending the staircase. Like, where's the nude, right? right. They had rules. Um, what were the, what, what rule is it that that was breaking? Well, you know, nudes are supposed to lie down. Right. Ru- ru- nudes are supposed to be fed grapes. They're not supposed to be s- descending stairs. In fact, where do you watch nudes descend stairs? Like, you know, you watch them descend stairs in brothels. You know, these are these are like all of these. Remember, because if you're an impressionist, you do luncheon in the grass, the frog in the corner means something, and the, the new woman with two fully dressed men means something. It's all symbolic and symbolism. And so with Duchamp, you essentially have this thing where he's he's muddling it for a contemporary artist or our audience. I mean, and so, you know, and, and look, let's be honest. He could have taken the painting down and continued to participate in the show. This is why Duchamp is different than everybody else. This is the key reason. He removed himself from the show. He said, I'm not going to compromise. I'm not going to do it. And he left, right? He didn't have to get kicked out. He could have taken the painting down and just been like everybody else. And if he had done that, we would have a very different world. But his own convictions are what led him 
to stay the course. Well, this is also something very contemporary, this idea that these people who are portray themselves as open-minded and anything goes, yeah. and then all it takes is that one troll to be like, okay, how about this? And then they, they clutch their pearls just as the people that they seek mm-hmm. to condemn, and they flip out. Yeah. And it, what's amazing over a hundred years later in retrospect, that again, this is literally just a title. There's not even, is the word nude wasn't some kind of slur or no, anything no. like that. <laughs> and, and they're still losing their minds. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, and then eventually when we get to the ready maids, he, he just, remember with Duchamp, he converts things into materials, right? We think of materials as physical things, but to him it's language, it's ideas. And so, so the idea of trolling can be a material, right? As an artistic expression. And so, yes, this is the beginning. And that moment, that decision he makes liberates everybody as we will see later on so the next big thing uh that he's known for uh, and correct me if i'm wrong is the bride strip bear yes okay so this was uh you could see it in philly uh yes. at the philadelphia one, Arts. one of five. Oh, right at the philadelphia the Art Museum. yeah um okay we got the chat room going um and if we could if we could pull it up it's called uh the bride strip bear uh and show it it's really um if you look at it, you're like, what the F am I looking at? Yeah. Right? Yeah. But then I learned from the documentary, this was by design. Oh, yeah. So he, it, it's not like these uh, many contemporary things you'd see in a museum where you're looking at it and you don't know what's going on and that's supposed to be the fault of the viewer. D- Duchamp basically had a guidebook yeah. for how to understand this, I, I would you call it a sculpture? It is it is a sculpture. A painted glass? It's a, it's a, it's a combination of painting and sculpture, but it goes even further, right? There are certain, unfortunately, because the concepts of the glass, I mean, you could do 10 movies in just the glass itself. It is It is also, um, first of all, to see it in person in the Philadelphia Art Museum is just amazing. It's gigantic. Um, and he worked on it for 12 years. And, you know, as we say in the film, he was really lazy. So, he, you know, I think one guy, uh, Michael Taylor, says he could, you know, Picasso would have done it in three hours. Duchamp takes 12 years. Kind of, kind of like getting free rent out of this piece because the Ahrensbergs, who were his patrons, said, hey, you can live up there. We'll get the large glass when you're done. Right, so they said to him, this was really funny, they, they had these patrons who said, all right, we like your, your the cut of your jib, Marcel. We are going to pay your rent as long as you make mm-hmm. this next work. Yeah. And he's like, oh, cool. I'll see you in 12. And then we get to keep it. And he's <laughs> yeah. like, okay, see you in 12 years. Yeah. So it shows that people do respond to incentives. They do. Even artists. Yes, absolutely. Who are like too yeah. cool for school. Absolutely. No, it is the thing. So, so Duchamp, it, it really starts in 19, 19, 12, 13, 14. He starts with just notes. He's taking notes about cool, interesting ideas. And it's because after the nude is is denied, he goes to he goes to Munich to, and he sees all of these machines and technology, and he just starts taking notes. And he's like, I mean, these are machines. We don't know what he saw, but the assumption is that he saw like grain machines, just the future. And so he starts making all these notes, and he's really into this idea of the fourth dimension, right? And the fourth dimension. The fourth dimension. You broke yeah. it down pretty well in the film. So the fourth dimension at the time. Right now, we think of the fourth dimension as time, which is a Einstein idea, which is 1919. But before that, it was the idea that um, you could actually geometrically create parallel spaces. So if you had a, one dot was the first dimension, a line is the second, a square is the third, and then once you start paralleling these things to to tetrahedrons and things, that would be a fourth dimension. It was a, it was a type of geometry. Right, and then the the other one was non Euclidean geometry, which reversed the the one of the postulates of Euclid. So these are the ideas that everyone is fiddling around with in Paris. But it's also like the I forgot who explained in the film. It's like if I put my hand in front of a light and I cast a shadow, yes. right? That's three dimensions into two. So yeah. basically, what we're seeing as reality is the third dimension, but it's a it's a the shadow, shadow of, of the, the fourth fourth higher fourth dimension. It's a very Plato idea. Exactly. And what's interesting about the fourth dimension, and this is I think where Duchamp really kind of grapples grapples onto it, is that the fourth dimension you cannot make it real. You can only think it, right? It's only something you can be thought. And I think this is kind of where he's heading. He's like this idea of like thoughts art conceptual ideas and so he he is trying to realize all of these kinds of like 
almost like pseudoscience ideas, whether it's non-Euclidean geometry, all these things. And he's trying to put them into this giant allegory, which is two panes of glass. And the top is the fourth dimension, and the bottom is the third dimension. And it's like this kind of weird allegory where there's this bride that hovers in the fourth dimension, which is a painting he made when he was in Munich. And on the bottom, there's all these these bachelors that are basically like, they're almost like steampunk characters. They look like chess pieces. They look like chess pieces. They're like kind of, they have little bolts and things. And this machine's supposed to work and then they're supposed to get the bride and, and win the bride, which clearly... They don't, and only half the glass is done. There's a, and so everything else is in the notes. So he's got all these notes, and he's got all these ideas, and he's trying to basically get them out. Um, and eventually, he just becomes bored. <laughs> it's just like he likes thinking about it more than he likes doing it, which is a really fascinating thing because you know artists are like, oh, you're not an artist unless you make art. And his thing is like, yeah, but thinking is making art, and so. That's kind of where he starts moving away from making things and gets more into the idea of ideas. But so I don't understand. So was the concept that when you're looking at this work that you have to have this handbook with you and you're supposed to be like yeah. referencing it as you're looking at this pane of glass? He thought it was going to be like a Sears robot catalog where you could actually, he says that. And you could open the book and you would understand the glass. Okay. But the irony is that later on, he he takes all the notes that tell you what the glass is. They He puts them into what is called the green box. And what's interesting about that is that there's no order to the notes. So there's no way to know where the notes go or how they work because they're also like kind of absurd. And so... The whole idea is you put all the notes in, and the last guy who put the notes in, you experience what he experienced. And when you put them back, the next guy experiences what you experienced. How much of this is him having these notes as a mechanism to explain the painting? And how much of it is him just being a BS artist, which is a type of artist, Mm -hmm. to try to make it seem deeper than it is? I don't, I think at the time he was actually trying to figure out these ideas. Because again, it'd be like if I, you know, showed you something that completely changed the paradigm, and you, what do you do? You think about it all the time. And, you know, with the iPhone these days, I take notes all day long. Like, oh, that's interesting. So, you can tell that he's taking notes on on hotel menus. He's taking notes on. I mean, he's taking notes. He's out doing things, and he's just because they're because they're on stationery. They're they're on all sorts of random things, um, and and he's also experimenting, right? And you can tell that at this moment he's moving from art um, as a thing that you do deliberately into the mode of experimentation, right? So he's playing with chance. He's playing with this idea of like, well. What if I if I if I want something and I set out to do it and I accomplish it that's not interesting. But if I want something and I accidentally do something else that is interesting. He's playing with discovery. And so these notes are things that he's doing things in his studio. He's kind of like a scientist. Um, and this piece is like a giant science piece. And he's he's working through the process. So I think in some ways the large class is less about the piece because the big debate is what's more important, the green box, the notes or the large glass. Right, and I would argue personally, and people will disagree with me. Um, the green box is more important than the large glass because that's the ideas, right? And there's all sorts of things in there that aren't even in the large glass. But here's the other thing: it's almost impossible to tell what the green box is talking about because it's just fragmented things, and you can kind of put them on the glass, but there's also other points where you don't know. And there's there's notes that have been broken out and were added many years later as well. So. The thing about this glass is it was it was impossible to transport. And yeah. and it, something ended up happening there. What happened there? So what happened was um, the Ehrenber- Ehrensbergs give it to Catherine Dreyer, um, who is a good friend. She's the one who uh, gave the col- large collection to Yale. Um, and she was they were transporting it. And what happened was is they you're supposed to transport glass upright. You're not supposed to transport glass on its side, right? Because it, it, so it hits a bump and it shatters. But what's interesting about the, the shatters is because the panels were lying on top of each other, all the shatters were the same. And one of the kinds of mechanisms in all of this new science is this idea of the mirror image, right? So when you take the glass panels and you separate them back, the glass shattered as a mirror reflection of each other. And because Duchamp is really interested in chance, and he's interested in this idea of serendipity, 
All he did was just glue it all back together, and he's like, "That's it's much better that way." That's what he needed. Yeah, you can. If the one in Philly is broken, it's broken. It's the that's the original. One. Yeah. If you go to like say the Moderna Mosite in Sweden, Stockholm, that's the that's the Uf Linder version that Duchamp signed. It's completely intact, and it's it's a completely different experience. It's actually weird to see it unbroken, you know. And the other thing is like it's coming apart. Because he just didn't make things to last, right? You know, because it wasn't that wasn't you know the important aspect, which we'll find out later about the ready mades. You know, there are very few Duchamp pieces. That's the irony of this guy. Yeah, and in many ways, he was much more. He was an example of uh, one of the first times when the artist was the celebrity instead of the work, mm -hmm. where the where the personality was who was someone was known as, yeah. uh, and and. You know, like and then, then actually, what he produced, yeah. uh, which again is a form of you know artistry in the sense in a yeah. you know in our culture. Before I forget, I really enjoyed this, and I just I know it just dropped today, but I you and I are good friends. You're always working on a lot of stuff. Yeah. What is the next documentary you're working on? We are doing a a documentary on the man who invented aerobics, Dr. Ken Cooper. Will be out by the end of the year. It's not Jack Lalanne. No. No, Dr. Did, Ken Cooper, 1968. He was training astronauts to go into space, and he discovered this. Is wait, aerobics has to do with like aerospace? Yes, I never even thought of that. Yep. Wow. Yep. Oh, okay. it's gonna be a good one. Have you been doing your aerobics? Cardio kills gains, you know. I know, I know. Oh, yeah, I, it's a mix. I have to do a mix. It's 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 two days of cardio, three days of weights, and one day of jazzercise every day. Every day is the jazzercise day. <laughs> um, let's talk about these ready mates because this is when. <laughs> Because what I th what I like about this movie and about his career is he likes um, to um, keep pushing the envelope. Oh yeah. So like you were saying, you know, because his career is so long that people are like, all right, now I can wrap my head around the large glass. So he's mm -hmm. like, oh crap, now I have to do something that'll upset everybody again. Oh yeah. So let's talk about the fountain. This so, is 1917. It is 1917. So World War One. To give a little context. You know, the nudes kicked out in 1912, but the new descending staircase is brought over to Where is it right now, by the way? It is in Philadelphia. Oh, it's there too, in that room? It is, okay. yes. And so it is brought over to the Armory Show. We just had the Armory Show this week in New York. It was brought over to the Armory Show in 1913, and it was the most scandalous thing in the United States. Roosevelt came in and said it looked like a- Teddy? Yeah, Teddy Roosevelt. When saw the new descending staircase, said it looked like a Navajo rug. Okay. Right? So that's what made Duchamp a celebrity, right? That's what brought him over. That's why he did the large glass here. Yeah, because a lot of the papers were like, what the hell is going yeah. on in Europe? And when they saw it, they were like, this <laughs> yeah. is even crazier than we thought. Yeah, what is it was like an explosion cubism? in a shingle factory. Yeah, like, like people will go and watch. I mean, it was like a monstrous scandal. But it was but made him super famous. But it's also the kind of thing what we see now where you could see how – you have these like indie movies coming from Europe, right? <laughs> yeah. And people who read The New Yorker, The New Yorker didn't exist at the time, were like, wow, this is genius. This is so sophisticated. And everyone else is like, these are two dudes covered in mayo, yeah, yeah. like playing Jenga. <laughs> this is not yeah. art. The Serbian film. You yeah, know? right, right. <laughs> yeah, you know? So it's, it was the, even 100 years yeah. ago, they were having the same argument oh, yeah. where he has this picture. It's not representational really of much. And yeah. everyone's like, oh my God, I've never seen anything like it, which is true. And everyone else is like, yeah, because it's garbage, you idiots. Yeah. Well, you know, and it's funny, you have to consider. Yeah, there's like a really important factor here why Duchamp liked America. We had no history. Yeah. There was nothing to compare it against. In France, it's like, well, we have 500 years of history and this doesn't look like this and that. We don't have any history. Our artists, remember, like when they came over from the old world, like only stupid people came over to paint in America because like you could get killed, right? <laughs> like, so so we don't have this developed, and, and plus no one looks at us as developed. Right. So Duchamp is digging it because he's a modern thinker. He's a future thinker. And so he's over here. He's now been here a couple years you know, he's he's a very popular guy. He's very nice. That's the other thing people don't realize about Duchamp. He's a very nice man. He's not a, he's not a jerk or anything like that. He's a lover. People love him. So anyway, the show that the new Descending Staircase was kicked out of was the Artist Independent show. And again, this is an off this is an offshoot. The 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 idea behind it is no jury, no prize. Right? You pay your money, you could get in the show. And so he got kicked out of the No Jury, No Prize show. It's like getting kicked out of the free show, right? Yeah. So he's over in America, and there's these, you know, there's these divisionist paintings. There's kind of like they're they're like in, they're like American impressionists, but they want to be 
a little bit more liberated. So they want to start their own independent show. Now, clearly, World War I had caused a lot of these guys to have to flee Europe. So they're all in New York. So what, what, is the, what do the Americans do? Hey, you guys, you guys do this stuff. Like, help us out, right? And so they asked Duchamp to be part of the show, like to kind of sit on the board, and essentially, in a way. And so, you know, what do they say? Hey, look, the show is no jury, no prize. Right, that's the show. That's the motto because we're going to model it after. Guess what? The French Independent show back in Paris, and so Duchamp's like, okay, fine. He goes. Wait, but by the way, let's just also point out this is such a lefty idea, and he's pointing out the hypocrisy of the left because, like, we don't like hierarchies. Yep. No one's better than anyone. It's like how the Oscars now doesn't have a host. We're gonna have ten nominees for best <laughs> yeah. picture. Yeah. You know, it's not. Uh, be- they don't call it the winner. It is they go the award goes to right because yes. no one's a winner. <laughs> yeah. So this was happening. A- this is what I talk about in my book and in general how popular culture mm-hmm. art they're taking yeah. it from the art and then it becomes corporate yeah. but 100 years ago they're having the same this thing no prizes no jury everyone's yep. equal everyone has value judge it on its own merits and he's like oh okay we'll see we'll see we'll, we'll see. see yeah we'll see so we'll see how liberal you are marcel duchamp you remember the same people in the show that kicked him out are there yeah right the cubists all these guys are there so you know he takes a urinal and he signs it armut Richard, and then Mutt for the comic book that was popular at the time. Mutt and, and Jeff? Yep. Okay. And he enters it into the show. Now. And that's the cover of the the, the DVD. That's the cover of the a DVD. Urinal. Well, actually, that and that's a replica. But right, we'll but, get to that. Urinal that is that's even cover. better. Right? So it's literally, he just takes a damn urinal. Yep. Signs it with signs a fake it, name. Mutt, and it goes, here you go. It's And art. enters it under Richard Mutt. Yeah. Not as himself. And so, clearly, the show explodes and flips out. Um. <laughs> And, and it they, wasn't even a used urinal. No, it was a new <laughs> urinal. And of course, actually on its side, it's actually for a moment you're like, wait, is that even a urinal? Yeah. It looks different, right? And and this causes everyone to flip out. Of course, they they he can't show it. He's not allowed to show it. Um, and he gets, of course, booted out of the show. Or Richard Mutt gets booted out of the show. So he takes it over, and you know, it's it's photographed. But he called it. Did he call it Fountain at the time? It's Fountain. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And so, and so, and, and, and when we get into the, the ready maids, there is actually an interesting context about why he chose certain objects. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it gets kicked out. But here, here's the thing, right? And this is really important. It gets kicked out. You know, his friends have a good laugh because it's hilarious. It's photographed. It's in this, you know, it's in the blind man, which is kind of like a, one of the, a, a, like a, like a publication his friends put together. But no one actually knows about the ready made till many, many decades later when it appears in the in the box in the valise. So th- that object is kind of lost for a while. And it technically is lost. Like, it's gone. We don't have one. There's only replicas. Um, but this was it. This was the test. And the idea was, like, to him, if you go back to the New Descending Staircase, the question is, why can't the New Descend the Stairs? Who made that rule? Who? Right, and this is what started the journey. So then, well, why can't this be art? What is it? Why? Who made these rules? Like, who is there a guy who makes the art rules? Yeah, and that's that. And so I think that it was a test, um, and he picked probably one of the most obscene object he could think of, of of the day. And you couldn't show a urinal. And look, also fifty percent of the audience um, was. Was had never seen a urinal as well, which is actually another thing he was playing. But do you know what else is funny? Is like in the '90s or the early 2000s, Roxette, uh, the band Roxette, Murray mm-hmm. Fredrickson, the girl singer, just recently passed away. They had a video where like she's singing on the toilet. She's not, not shitting on it; like it's yeah. closed, like her yeah. foot's up on it, and the video was banned. Of course. So even like a hundred years later, can't get away. <laughs> you can't show a, something that we all look at every yeah. single day. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, it was so shocking. But here's the thing. He knew. Because it, he's talking about context. Yeah. He's so about if, ton- if you're context. looking at a urinal in the bathroom, no one thinks twice. If you take it in yep. the, oh, art. Yeah. And you put this vulgar, commonplace, <laughs> everyday thing that you and literally piss it. on and you sign it. Sign it. signature. This is yes. holy. This is the highest thing. And you put it in this art show for the good people mm-hmm. who are better than everybody. And now you're like, all right, here's a piss hole. Like yeah. they lose their minds. They lose their minds. And, and the thing is, is if you... I, one of the, uh, Francis Nauman in the film says that, you know, he, he told me that he takes students to the MoMA and a hundred years later, you have two groups form on either side of it to debate, is it art? 
a hundred years later. Yeah. So this is not what he raised with that gesture has not been solved by any stretch. In fact, it's become more important now as we have moved into a conceptual economy. I mean, like, you know, what our companies is all these illusions, all these things we believe, their belief systems. He's really challenging your belief that something can be art at all, which, of course, evolves as the ready mades as a concept become more of a thing. And that's the other thing. It's uh, he is one of the first artists to have that sense of humor. Yeah. Because he is consciously doing it as a joke. He's not joke. saying like, oh, I'm demonstrating to them their hypocrisy, which he is. But he's also like, this will be funny. Let's yeah. see what happens. Because he was never he was never cruel. Right. Right. It's funny. It's hilarious. I mean, there's a lot of humor in the large glass itself. I thought that they displayed it behind a curtain. Well, they put it behind a curtain because they couldn't display it out there. But the thing is, nobody knows what happened to it. And, okay. and and here's the irony of the story. And this is another reason I love Duchamp. Remember, all these stories about Duchamp are told 50 years later, right? And so there's always this idea of like, well, we've never seen it. Like, is it real? <laughs> you know, he played with that idea of like, well, maybe, you know, maybe we're making everything up. There was no photographs at the time? There's one photograph. Okay, so we know it's famous real. photo. Maybe. Maybe. I mean, I've heard crazy stories. Well, let's hear those crazy someone stories. Someone told me. Someone told me recently, and again, I, I I don't condone any of these. I don't know if it's true that that maybe he didn't sign Armut, and maybe it was actually painted on the photo after the fact, and none of it happened. Oh wow! Yeah. And this is, but Duchamp, like everybody else, Picasso, everybody else, like came out. They told their stories. They owned their brand. Duchamp came out when TV. He understood television. This is where Andy Warhol would get it, yes. understanding how to how to manipulate the interview. Um, and he would say he would just make things up. You know, like why not? Like you know, it's a, hey, everybody looks a good story. But I mean that again. When you talk about later in the film, which we'll get to, is the con like I hate how people think performance art is mm -hmm. just like like uh, lesbians like covering in themselves in body paint and screaming about their period. Like that's <laughs> just because bad performance art exists, or yeah. just because the vast majority of performance art is bad, does not mean the. Uh, issue is itself inherently impossible or wrong. Of course not. So this is a very early form of performance art where the artist he's is the He's the performer. father of performance art yeah. in many and ways. And he's like, oh, okay, I'm just going to make up this story. And that's art at its best yeah. provokes a reaction in the viewer or the audience. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's doing. He's like, yeah, yeah, I made up this crazy story. Maybe it's true or maybe it's maybe not. not but know. you're sure... <laughs> <laughs> There's no one who hears the story of the fountain and doesn't have some sort of reaction. Either this guy's a con artist, yeah. or this is hilarious, or both, or, or it's clearly thought provoking about the nature of art. Well, and that's the thing. I think that you know, I think the problem is Duchamp's taught a certain way. Oh, he did the ready made, did the large glass in the news in his staircase, but he again, he's always grappling with the idea of value and what, why do we value something? Why is this valuable? Like why? Right, he's grappling. They're real things he's grappling with. The nice thing, he's lighthearted enough to do it in ways that are really dynamic. He's always looking for a way to subvert expectations, that horrible term that's used these days all the time. But he's doing it, and he's actually living it because there's a certain extent where like, oh, I can be shocking. But if you don't follow through somewhere in your life, yeah. it doesn't work. And he followed through literally to the end of his life. I mean, he never, if, it, if it's a character, he never broke it. I mean, he went all the way through it. And there's very few people who are committed, so committed to like living the way he lived and following through. And I think we all, you know, we're better for it. The innovators are better for it. Before I forget, I really enjoyed this. And I just, I know it just dropped today, but I, you and I are good friends. You're always working on a lot of stuff. Yeah. What is the next documentary you're working on? So yeah, we've been uh, uh, doing research on a project that I want to do on Robert Moses, the master builder. Did you watch Motherless Brooklyn, the Ed Norton movie? It is in my queue right now to watch. Uh, I'm very excited to watch it. My is it good? My buddy Ethan Suppley's in it. It's very long. Okay. And it w I'm glad I saw it. Yeah, no, I'm I'm excited. I, I've read The Power Broker four or five times. I'm shocked. Oh, God. it's a, How long is it? 2,000 pages? It's been crazy. Yeah, it's 66 hours on the audiobook. I keep it on my phone permanently. Just pick passages at random. Who is a worse human being? Robert Moses or Lyndon Johnson? I think Lyndon Johnson is a much worse human being. Much worse. Because yeah, he killed well, people. He ki Yeah. Yeah, you know, look, I, I don't have the I don't same view Kennedy. of Robert Moses as everybody else. Well, you don't think just... As a human being, he was a, a despicable person. Well, I think he had despicable aspects to him, absolutely. You know, but I think that I think that one man wrote a book, and no other no other person ever wrote a book, 
and no one's ever reevaluated beyond that book. And that's a book I love. Okay. You know, and so I think I think in the context of like where infrastructure is now and the 50 years since the the um, these movements have changed, the uh, uh, what's it called? The preservation movement has changed the country in some negative ways as well. So we had 40 years on and we've had 40 years off. Let's reevaluate and maybe we come to the same conclusion. You think Jane Jacobs is just a uh, uppity bitch, don't you? Well, I mean, look, like if I was, you know, if I, if I could just, you know, live wherever I wanted to live, it's a lot easier to be like, hey, what's up? It's my neighborhood is awesome. But not, not everybody had that option. Sure, sure. Hey, guys, Michael Malice here. I want to tell you about Ridge. Ridge is, I like Ridge because it's a really cool minimal front pocket wallet that streamlines what you carry every day. They got their start on Kickstarter many years ago, just as I did, and now they have sold over half a million. If you go to ridge.com slash malice, you get 10% off of your order. Comes in over a dozen styles and colors, titanium, carbon fiber, aluminum. It's free returns if you don't like it, free and a lifetime warranty if you do. These are great, great gifts. They look stylish. They look sophisticated. You haven't seen anything like it. It's two metal plates bound together by an elastic band. Uh, there's an option for everyone. You don't want that George Costanza wallet so there's something bulging. Thieves know what those are. If you go to ridge.com slash malice or use code malice, you get 10% off your order. You're a grown-up. Get a grown-up wallet. Let's get back to the show. Were the ready-mades the next big thing in his career? Yeah. Well, what's interesting about the ready-mades is, you know, you have the bicycle wheel, and there's different kinds of ready-mades. There's assisted well, ready-mades. Let's break down what those are. Yeah, how, there's how assisted ready-mades and unassisted ready-mades. There's, there's like uh, the dog comb. But what which, is a ready-made? So like? what a ready-made is, essentially, it's an object that's already made, and and you essentially call it art. Yeah. Right. And you see, of course, everyone's used to this now. But at the time, you know, you had to like go paint something or make something. You had to do all this labor and blah, was this blah, after blah. the abstract expressionists? Yes. Yes. So this. Is, no. 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 I'm sorry. No. Before. This, this is before. Is before. Ab- wow. Yeah. Okay. No, because remember, he does. What's interesting about Duchamp is he essentially does the bulk of his work like by 1923. Right, so like the ready mades are kind of all done. Everything's all really done. I mean, he does other things throughout his life, like other pieces and things. But for the bulk of the work is done, right? And he's not he's not really rediscovered till the late fifties and sixties. So there's this huge period of time where he's not really doing a lot. He's doing things, but remember, he's an experimenter. So on the first, a lot of the first ready mades is like sister went in his studio and threw them all out because she didn't know they were things. They were art, which is kind of what he loves. Yeah. Right. He loves this idea of like coat racks and bottle racks and like and again going back to these things is a lot of the objects he chose. There's half of the audience doesn't know what they are. But like where a, did he choose them? Where did he display them? Like how do, how does this happen to be like a that, thing that he takes a bicycle wheel, says this is art, and now it, it's for sale somewhere? What what was well, the process? And there? again, that n- none of the most most of the original ready mades are are gone. Right. So they were tossed out. I mean, that's the thing. He's just doing things. But where right? is he? Do- where is he doing? He's got things? a studio. Okay. In New York City, and he's basically just putting things on top of things and putting things together. He's working on the large glass, and he's doing this all simultaneously. So he's working on the large glass, and he liked to spin the bicycle. We like kinetic art. He liked. He said that. The spinning of the bicycle wheel was like the flicker of the fireplace, like in the, in okay. the, your peripheral vision. So he kind of was just playing with these things. He's playing with language. He's doing weird things with language. He's doing experiments. He likes. He's a, he's a pseudo scientist. And so the idea, these concept of the ready mates, like where did they come from? How did they were they displayed? Um, that was what was so so strange. Is that like they were displayed in different shows? Because remember, Duchamp is also. He's friends with Dali. He's friends with Breton. He's friends with all these guys. He's kind of in their movements. Remember when he got kicked out of the of the and this is a, this is a, actually an important fact to go back to when he got kicked out of that show back in Paris um, because of the New Sydney Staircase. He vowed to never join a group. He was anti group thick. If you're part of a movement, if you're part of a group, I want nothing to do with it. I'm an individual and I work individually and I do my own thing. 
right? But he was always around these guys, and they were all friends, and he would assist them and help them. So, you know, he took the Mona Lisa, he put the goatee, the mustache, Let's talk about this. Yeah, he takes the Mona Lisa. He takes a postcard. Even at the time, it was one of the most recognizable images of all time. I'm going to... I'm going to tell them. Uh, uh, and he draws a goatee. A goatee and, and a, a mustache, mustache on it. And writes L-H-O-O-Q at the bottom. Which right. Phonetically, Loshaku. She has a hot ass. Okay. But also in English, it says look. Yeah. That's a, another yeah, way of looking at yeah. it. Yeah. And so, so but this it's is- It's graffiti. The, it's graffiti. Well, he's, I, in the film, we say- he's, How, What he's year the, was this? This is, I think, I believe it was 1919. So this is like 50 years or 40 years before Warhol yeah. would do very similar things. Yeah. And so, so what's interesting about it, it's like the first meme. Yeah. And again- the context of this thing is that you could not do this before photo mechanics. This is a 20th century technology. He's using technology. And he's using the idea that we've all seen the Mona Lisa, even though you've never seen the Mona Lisa, right? And right, that's great. Yeah, no yeah, one's seen the original, but we no all know what she we've looks all like. seen it, yes. right? So he's he's looking at these contemporary technologies, and he is looking at context, and he's looking at value, right? Because the other thing that's crazy about the ready-made is like they're indifferent. Right, they're not. They don't aesthetically look alike. He's breaking these things down. So, so if you walked in and I saw a bicycle wheel over here, and I saw a bottle rack over there, and I saw a a, a, a coat hanger, like I would not particularly think these were. First of all, you may not think they're art. Sure. Second of all, you may not know they're made by the same artist because sure. they weren't made. Right. He's destroying style. He's destroying taste. He's destroying aesthetics. And so this postcard is great because um, it was a it was a Brent Tong, I think wanted it for a show. And, and Duchamp's like, well, you're just going to have to make your own. So he went and bought a postcard. He puts the, the mustache but forgets the goatee. But that's a meme. It's evolved. Yeah. Then Duchamp takes it later. He removes the things, and he calls it, you know, shaved. <laughs> <laughs> right? So he restores it to the original. He basically. restores it to the original. This is a conversation right. with history. It's, he, he said, use a Rembrandt as an ironing board. I mean, it, he's asking, why are you are – you, worshiping this thing like why but, what it makes it better than other things and it's also the idea that if i take a postcard of the mona lisa mm-hmm. and deface it to some way does that in any way lessen mm-hmm. the value of the original and in a sense you could very easily make the case that it's increasing the value of the original because now everyone's feeling protective of her <laughs> and everyone's talking <laughs> yeah, about her yeah. and everyone's thinking about how important she is and how dare you even though it's like he's how defacing you. a postcard how dare you how dare you yeah <laughs> so he is it's really it's amazing how a hundred years ago mm-hmm. uh all these people who yeah. thought they were enlightened and looking, turning their backs in the past, the second he challenges these conventions, they're still like, oh, no, 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 no. How no, dare no. you? How dare you? And, you? and we'll see at the end of his life, he does it again yeah. with the Tandone. And so the thing is, is that, that you know, he is, he's breaking all the, what, what it does, what the ready-made does is art is this vertical, Right. And this is the MoMA at the top, and this is us. The, we're the people who get to roam the galleries. Sure. And he takes it and he turns it into a horizontal, because now all things are activatable, and anyone could do it. Right? He's the democratization of art making. He he's breaking down all of these these hierarchies, and 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 the thing is, the best way to do it is by by either signing a Mona Lisa, or or signing a urinal. It's it's a it destroys the value, right? Even Duchamp pieces today are not that valuable, on purpose. You know, I mean, I think was it the Rauschenberg bottle rack was like a million bucks, and by art standards, it's kind of not a lot, right? And so the thing is, is that I mean, you could still go buy Duchamp things on eBay, right? Really? What do you mean? <laughs> yeah. What kind of Duchamp like books? He just made weird magazine. He did he did a lot of magazine stuff. He did he just did things like a lot. Of, he did worked in a you know, uh, various publication type things. And so there's just stuff out there. There's little bits and pieces that he would do. And so you you can, you find that he's changing the context of this idea of art as this monolith that you can't reach. And and that's what, uh, I was gratified from watching the film. When I went to Philly, Mm -hmm. they had the bicycle wheel. Oh yeah, you saw, yeah. He says, no, this is art. And you read it and it says, this is a replica of the original bicycle wheel. And I was all angry. And then I watched the movie and I'm like, oh wait, that's what he wanted. Like, yeah. tell that story. So, so it's amazing that by the by so the he 50s, makes the, he takes a bicycle wheel. He says it's art. <laughs> then it goes in the garbage, right? Yeah. 
or it's gone. It's we don't gone know where. somewhere. Yeah, no yeah. You know, well, I mean, look, it's one of those things where like, there's certain things where he, Duchamp himself may not have thought they were art when he did it. Sure. They were just, A I statement. mean, look, they're doodles. You ever doodle? Right. You ever be like, oh, I think we're gonna do it like this. And like, and but you know, the thing is, is the art world's like, oh, he did it. His hand touched it, right, so that's right. valuable. So, so you know, later on, do as you know you that, get, that Trump does that? But, so there's a law that anything the president writes like has to be preserved by the records, oh, and he has a shredder. And he just rips up everything when he's done with it, yeah. like a businessman. And there's someone whose job is to go through the trash and tape this shit together for oh posterity. God. Yes. Because he's of breaking the law. That's a lot of doodles. Yeah. That's a lot of doodles. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, but like, yeah, this is something. I mean, look, what Duchamp's dealing with has it's not just about art, it's about everything. Right. Anybody who's famous or valuable or anything. So so what happens is in in the fifties. Um, you start getting people doing replicas of the ready-mades, people who remember it, people who kind of um, were around, uh, people who who saw value in it. And so, of course, you have you have um, Richard Hamilton does a replica of the large glass. You have Oof Linder in Stockholm does a whole series of replicas of the of the fountain of a whole bunch of pieces, the three standard stoppages. Um, and so, so you have with his, his approval, right? Yeah, with his approval, okay. with Duchamp's approval. And of course, Arturo Schwartz, um, who's in M- Milan, um, visits Duchamp and just hey says, hey, let's make an edition of these things. And so they get the photographs. They reproduce them, so that's why this urinal here looks different. This urinal here was was one that was found and signed, but the later ones were actually made off photos and things like that. So there's there's eight editions of the Arturo Schwartz editions, and then there, I think there's one for him and one for Duchamp, and then uh, there's a maybe one more for another collection. Actually, uh, Bloomington, Indiana has the complete collection. Oh, all together. Okay. I think they have number eight. Uh, r- most of them have been broken up all over the world, and so they have a complete collection of ready-mades if you want to go see it they were very gracious to let us film them it's super cool so um basically they made these replicas the large they made replica large glasses they made replicas of ready-made so most of the time when you go see a ready-made it's not the original it's a fabricated object which when i was when i was 19 grappling with this idea of ready-made as a young artist my favorite thing was that you go into the Philadelphia Art Museum and there is a urinal that says, do not touch. <laughs> and then I walk down the hall and there's a whole line of urinals of which I urinated to. <laughs> and to me, that is so Duchampian. Like, that's the thing. Why? This one versus all of these. And especially because that one isn't even the original. It's not, that's not the, the famous it's one. It's a replica. <laughs> there. Yeah. It's, this, is, this is where he continuously challenges what we do and what we think. I mean, even John Cage said he would go to an event and he didn't know if the light switches were part of the event. He didn't know if the table, he didn't know what to touch because Duchamp has broken down that, that uh, the blood brain barrier of was this art? I don't know. And of course we tell the story in the movie about the comb, which was Duchamp's favorite piece. And it's the dog comb. I think that's actually one that's, that's an original. Um, And it has these, these words written, these absurd words written on, on it. But Michael Taylor says people would walk in and go, is that a Duchamp? Is that art? And they'd leave it alone because they didn't think it was art. And that was Duchamp's favorite. Yeah. Right? That's what he's dealing with. These are the ideas. It's ready-mades are a tension between art and non-art. They're making you question. You know, look, you walk into MoMA, right? You walk into MoMA. There's Starry Night. Pat on my back. I, I'm like, you know, I know stuff. Then you walk into the Duchamp room and there's a bicycle wheel. And what the wheel does is it makes you question why is it there at all? That's you didn't question why that other thing was there. You didn't say, "Oh, why Starry Night there?" You said, "Well, it's there because it's art." You didn't question what is art, why is it there, why is it even, why is this here and something else not here? But you question that, and it and it makes you question everything. This is what's funny about him because a lot of times people will have this idea that someone will take a bag of potato chips and put in a bowl and call it art. And then if you don't think it's art, that that artist is in a position or that critic to laugh at you and tell you you, you're, you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, Duchamp did not like but that. But Duchamp was the one who's agreeing with you. Yes. He's the one who's saying, yeah, you're right. These yeah. people with the potato chips, they don't know what the hell they're doing. I'm an artist. Yeah, I, why is this art? I agree with you. So he's actually taking the populist view. Well, it's interesting because this is the, the pure art coefficient of 1958. The, the, the essay is super important, right? The Creative Act essay is super important. And this is a thing that I think that the the art world would be 
should heed his words. And it's, it's not a very long essay. I, I really recommend everybody look it up. But he had this concept that the artist was a media mystic. And so as you create something, you don't actually know what you're doing, right? And it cannot be completed until the audience adds their own, you know, part. Meaning that I make this movie and I'm like, man, I made a great movie. This movie's awesome. And someone comes along and is like, man, I hate your movie. It's terrible. And and I'm not there to defend myself. That is their interpretation. So so Duchamp said that there's this art coefficient, which is the difference between my intention as the artist and your interpretation as the audience, right? And and why should the audience not be part of the conversation? Isn't this how the market works? Yeah. He understood the market, right? He understood it. And he understood the idea that that the artist doesn't always get to tell you you're a dummy because you don't like it. Right. And so you could actually have a conversation. You can judge and be part of it. And ultimately at the end of the day, isn't that what all of art history is history is? Don't curators get together and say, hey, this should go in and that should go out. Right. And then we just never get to see it. Isn't that what it is? And so I think with Duchamp, he empowers the viewer to their own opinion. If you don't like the, the ready maids, if you don't like the large glass, he's like, That's cool, man. I, I threw mine out. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know where I don't, it is. Yeah, it's cool. That's fine. And if you love it. Right. I mean, look, I think this is something like me personally as a Duchampian, right? If someone loves, you know, I don't know, uh, uh, Britney Spears, that's great. I'm glad. I'm glad they take pleasure. It may not be my thing, but why should I sit there and be like, you suck because you like Britney Spears? There's no hipster hierarchy here. It levels everything. And this goes into the whole Warhol idea, which yeah. is that uh, you're going to paint things like a soup can and Elvis mm -hmm. and Elizabeth Taylor, things that again the new yorker crowd would turn their noses down yeah. and he's like you think you're better than this but you're not they're, you're they're, not. this stuff is awesome and you're wrong <laughs> yes and to have this kind of uh camille palio who's like one of my great heroes she's the one who talks about mm -hmm. this constantly that this distinction between high art and low art is completely phony and, and arbitrary yeah. it's a total shell game and you know warhol and, and you know Deschamp earlier are the ones who basically blow it up in their face yeah and be like, you're just pretentious assholes. Yeah. I mean, look, I, it, you have this thing where it's interesting because, you know, what got me into Duchamp, you know, is I, my, my father gave me this book in 1997 written by Calvin Tompkins. I read the book as I was going into art school. And the things that Duchamp was grappling with, with technology, as a young artist, I was also grappling with because it was the turn of the millennial. Yeah. We had Google. We had Apple. We had the democratization of technology. What, where, where are we going? And to me, he was, a, he was a guide for that. And the thing is, is like, what was the 21st century about? It was about democratization, right? You didn't have to be an apprentice in a movie studio for nine years before you could touch an editing system. You could go buy one from yeah. Apple. It was the great democratization of technology. It was the opening up of everything. And Duchamp, to me, was the guide. He was the guy. Yeah, the, the hierarchy, this idea of like, well, you can't do this and you can't do that. Well, what can't you do? Before I forget, I really enjoyed this, and I just I know it just dropped today, but I, you and I are good friends. You're always working on a lot of stuff. Yeah. What is the next documentary you're working on? So the next thing we're working on is a film on the elasticity of hair. How's that? Well, I mean, you know, we're trying to figure out how elastic hair is. I mean, what's, what's your background on this? Well, I don't have any background. That's why I'm making a movie. Guys... The best sponsors are the ones who show me the product to try out, and then I can speak from experience. And I'm talking to you about Vessi Footwear, V-E-S-S-I footwear.com, promo code WELCOME. You get 25% off your order. Here it is. So what Vessi is, these are my gym shoes now. I needed new gym shoes, and the universe came through, and they became a sponsor, and now I wear them every single day, except Fridays, which are rest day. So what are they? They're waterproof and weatherproof knit sneakers. What I like about them is they look just odd enough to be intriguing, but not so odd that people are like, what are you wearing on your feet? That's the sweet spot. I got the weirdest ones, which are this red with cream sole, but they've got black, they've got gray, they fit really comfortably. Uh, it's all vegan. Uh, okay, well, well, that's all right. Uh, the grip on the bottom is for all weather, herringbone tread pattern antimicrobial insoles, and it's if you go to vessifootwear.com slash welcome, you get 25% off your order, and I wear these every day, except for Friday.
which is rest day. Let's get back to the show. The last, uh, the last thing he did. Uh, what's the title of it? That hit. Atandone. Atandone. What's yes. that mean in English? Um. Oh, geez, I just forgot. Okay. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> it's this. This work is. I, I hate it. everyone talks about arts. Art's amazing. This is amazing because it's hidden in the room in the Philadelphia Art Museum. Did you see it? With, did I did. See, I did see it. So wild, basically, right? there's there's if you go off, there's the big Duchamp room with all his stuff. Cool. And and it, it's kind of unassuming that this is the Duchamp room. You know, yeah. it's, it, you it looks like all the other rooms, but you have to really know what you're looking at in a sense. Off in the corner, there's this little. It looks like it's going to a bathroom or a janitor's yeah. closet, and there are these two doors. And they're locked. Oh, you can't come close. I don't think you can touch them. No, no, you can touch them. Oh, you, you can, can put your face right up okay. against it. It's like a big wooden but door. But in these two wooden do double doors, there's holes. Yeah. And if you look through the peep holes, <laughs> there's this beautiful, like, naked woman splayed on the grass. Is, yeah. is it photograph? Is it no, sculpture? No. It's real. Uh, it's, it's, oh, it's, it's a body a cast. It's a body it's, cast. So it's like a 3D installation. It's a giant. It's probably the size of this room. Okay, it's huge. Yeah, okay. yeah and it's interesting. So the attendone is the is a final piece that Duchamp does and he does it and nobody knows right people saw bits and pieces of it but they never put it together till he died right and it's just this it's this weird experience first of all it goes back to optics like looking through the holes it goes back to all his interest in optics it draws in the the, the nude from the nude the staircase so he opens with the nude it closes with the nude yeah. um he's got this waterfall that's running it's just oh the actual waterfall actually runs that's running oh okay. yeah yeah if you look it's actually moving i mean he it's a it's a mechanical masterpiece right and you look through, and there's this spread eagle woman in your face, right? And and um, she's got a very weird pubic area, like it's it's pigskin stretched over, like like he learned how to how to make books. Okay. Um, and he's stretched over this this thing he makes, and he makes it over, and then there's and she's holding this this lantern, right? And so um, the the etandone comes from a note from that from the green box. That is the first note of the large glass. So they are connected to each other. And what's interesting is like he didn't want anyone to know he had this thing until he after he died. And and this is in, in true Duchamp form, all his contemporary friends were like WTF man. Like they were pissed. Cause it's essentially undoes all of the work he did with the ready made and contemporary it was it was a it was a, a a real life piece it was a it was an actual it was a classical piece extremely realistic extremely realistic and you're look and the other thing that i found and the it, light is yeah. like unbelievable but what's amazing about this it's like it's a work of art that you can't really see like it's it's hidden by design yeah it's hidden by design it's not meant to be proudly displayed front and center yeah. it's in a room off to the side yeah. and you have to kind of peek through a hole and you can and that's if people even get near the door yeah they sometimes they just look in there and think that's the piece because that room is not lit no it's not lit it's just a, it's just like a wooden door in a room we right. lit it up for the film right um but yeah it's it's one of those weird things that like duchamp challenges you to look at the work but it's also the idea this is where you get the idea of installation art oh like, yeah this is built into that room built into it you can't really take it out yeah and now you kind of have to experience it yeah i mean look he's connected to to body art installation art I mean, music poetry i mean he did if it was there to be done he did it and he tried to do it and change it and and you know again what is the value i mean the, the thing is crazy thing about that piece um is that it's it's a massive it's got motors and it's got wires like he was building it like in his studio you know in, in midtown just kind of like putting together and and he took him 20 years he'd be walking down the street he'd see like a brick he'd grab the brick and bring it back to the studio and he just kind of accumulated these things and built this thing and then one day it's unveiled and like some people were pissed i mean they were angry they thought it was violent rape culture type you know yeah wow. some people were very upset cuz and and again it just completely flew in the face but look that's Duchamp. He's never, he says, I'm not going to, you know, I have to contradict myself to avoid conforming to my own taste. And that was it. He thought you had to rebel against yourself to remain vital. Apparently, a tondo naming since. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we're running out of time. Absolutely. What has been your favorite part of the interview? My favorite part of the interview? I really liked talking about futurism. You are welcome. <laughs> 